probably two days to get through this. We're going to talk about floating point numbers. And um, in order to motivate this, or the way that it actually will work, take a minute and think of the biggest number you can come up with, and also the smallest number you can come up with. So just come up with a really big number and a really small number. All right, so somebody give me a really big number. Nine million. Well, here, let me put big, and over here we'll put small. Okay, nine million is pretty big. Can anybody top that? Yeah. Ten to the power of huh? Ten to the power of a hundred. Huh? That's cheating. Yeah. Anybody top that? Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah, right. Okay, we, we can keep playing that game. Uh, what about on the small side? Huh? Okay, so that'd be 10 to the minus 100, right, or so on. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm actually, you know, maybe mildly surprised I didn't get any of this. Right, that's a pretty important big number. Um, uh, or... Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, or something like that. Um, all right. And then, you know, if, if we, we pick, say, a small number, here's, here's one that uh, maybe some of you will recognize. That's the universal gravitational constant. Okay. Um, and I'll refrain from what I was thinking for the small one, but yeah. The average number of seconds that a beta hats last before being snatched. Yeah, too soon. Yeah. Okay, so um, once we got past the 9 million, right, what, what was the key to sort of expressing these things? Yeah, we, we use sort of scientific notation, right? So we wrote it as something times 10 to the something. And that gave us a lot more flexibility in terms of, of expressing really large numbers or really, really small numbers like the universal gravitational constant. Okay. Uh, now, uh, floating point arithmetic or floating point numbers on a computer are going to work basically the same way, okay, uh, with one, well, two exceptions, two differences. One, we're doing it in binary instead of base 10, okay? That makes sense. And two, uh, 10 to the minus 100, right, uh, the exponent is also a very large number, okay? And in all of these examples that we came up with, the exponents could be basically whatever we wanted, uh, there was sort of no limit to the size of the exponent, either big or small. Uh, on uh, computer floating point numbers, the exponent will have to be within sort of a fixed range. And so there's a theoretical maximum that we could express and a theoretical minimum that we would be able to express. And that all depends on how many bits we decide to use for the encoding. Okay, So like with the integer stuff that we did last time, if we say, all right, I'm going to give myself eight bits here, uh, then uh, as a, well, let's just remind ourselves, if I do eight bits and I do a signed integer, what's the biggest one that I can represent? 127, and the smallest is negative 128, okay? So I can encode everything in that range, and that's it. Can't encode in 129 or 150 or anything uh, smaller than minus 128. 
Okay. So in the floating point scheme, we'll sort of have a similar kind of issue that we'll be able to encode numbers that are in some range, okay, um, and not every number in that range, uh, and the precision at which we can do so is going to be an interesting thing because it's not uniformly distributed. Okay. So, um, right. Okay. So let's take, uh, just for sake of example, our 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay. So I'm going to write explicitly a plus out front. I don't have to because the, our convention, right, is that you only have to put a, a sign in front if it's minus. If it's plus, it's just you don't write anything. Okay. And so there are really three pieces to this. I have a sign, which is plus. I have an exponent, which is 23. And I have what's called a mantissa, which is the 6.02 bit. Okay, um, and then I don't strictly speaking need to specify that it's 10 to the whatever because, well, that's the arithmetic system we all use as, as humans, so I don't actually need to transmit that information to you. If I just said sine plus exponent 23 mantissa 6.02, you'd be like, oh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and then great. Now you know the number. Okay, um, so we'll break, when we encode these uh, in binary, we'll encode them only having these three components, the sine, the exponent, and the mantissa, okay? Now, uh, and we'll look at each of these in, in turn, okay? The mantissa is, uh, we'll start there, Okay, and the convention that we have in scientific notation is you always write precisely one digit before the decimal point, right? So I would write 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, could I have written 0 0.602 times 10 to the 24th? Yeah, that's equivalent, but would I ever write it that way? Only under one circumstance, and that's if you're trying to add or do arithmetic with uh, with several numbers that are in this form. Okay, we'll talk about that on Monday. Um, but otherwise, you would only ever write one, precisely one digit before the decimal point, and then, you know, however much afterwards, just depending on, on the precision. Okay, so uh, in base 10, how many choices are there for that digit that goes before the decimal point? Well, there's nine of them. Okay, it would be 10, except we already said that you can't use zero. Okay, because otherwise you could just shift until uh, you've got a non-zero thing in front of there. Okay, so in binary, the mantissa always starts with a one. Okay, because if I say you can only put a non-zero digit before the the decimal point, and we've got two digits, zero and one, and it can't be zero, what does it have to be? It must be a one, okay? And so the benefit of this is that I don't actually have to store that one because it's assumed, right? Now, we couldn't do this in base 10, right? If I just told you 0.02, you would have no way of knowing that it was supposed to be 6.02 versus 7.02 or something, right? But in binary, I can get away with this because there's only two bits, okay, uh, or two uh, binary digits. Okay, so, uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing here. And so for the binary mantissa, the mantissa will be the stuff that comes after the decimal point only because the one that's before it, like I said, we get to assume. Okay, one other piece of terminology. What should we call the decimal point if we're working in binary? Well, does decimal really make sense? Yeah, okay, we, the binary point we could, 
like decimal, like the, the deck in decimal is, is a base 10 kind of number. So that doesn't really make sense. Um, and so the word that we use is actually Latin, radix. Okay, it means root. Um, okay, so we'll no longer call it the decimal point and instead we'll call it the radix. But it basically is the decimal point. It's just sort of uh, what you call this in a non-base 10 system, just for um, clarity. Okay. Um, and then the exponent and the mantissa, or sorry, the sine thing, uh, will we'll take in turn. Okay. So in order to do this, let's just start, let's just pick a number for sake of example. Okay, and I'm going to choose the number 2.5. Perfectly good number. Okay, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to think about, all right, how would I write 2 in binary? 1, 0, right, and depending on which order you state the digits in. Okay, but the place values, right, I have 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1st, and so on. And so I would write this. And I'd put my radix here. And then I'd continue. Okay, so in the same way that, like, what does 6.02 mean? 6 plus the 0 is in which position? The tenth place, there's none of those, okay, and the two is in the hundredth place, or ten to the minus two, okay. So here we'll have two to the minus one, two to the minus two, and theoretically we could continue this however far we wanted to, okay. So instead of powers of ten, like before, it's powers of two. Okay, what is two to the minus first? 0.5 as a decimal, one half as a fraction, and just because I picked 0.5, how many times does 0.5 go into 0.5? Once, and there's no leftovers. So any subsequent bit that I would write down would all be zeros. Okay? All right, so for reasons that will become clear in a moment, let me... Uh, write down one additional zero. Okay, so I have a total of five things that I've written down. Okay, and so I could write this like so. Okay, one zero point one zero zero times two to the zero. Okay, would you guys agree that that is exactly the number two and a half. I've just written it in binary style scientific notation instead of base 10 style uh, scientific notation. Okay. All right. So we're, we're no, by no means done yet. Okay. Does this obey our rule about how many things go in front of the radix? It does not. I have two things in front of the radix rather than just one. Okay. But I can always shift the radix at the expense of changing the exponent. Okay. So if I wrote, changed this to be 1.0100, I have to make the exponent a 1. Okay, so is that okay? And now it it uh, fulfills our rule that th thou shalt have exactly one thing before the radix, and that thing in binary must be a one. Okay, so what this tells me is that all of this stuff is my mantissa. Okay, and the particular scheme that we're going to use for this we will use four bits for our mantissa. Uh, we'll use three bits for our exponent and we'll need one bit for a sign bit. So a total of eight bits, okay? 
but we've just figured out the mantissa bits. Okay. All right. Now the exponent is the number one. And for reasons that I really don't want to explain right this instant, we don't actually encode one. We're going to encode three bigger than that. Okay, now that may seem really stupid. There's a good reason for it. And like I said, I'll, I'll deal with that later. So add three to it. What do we get? Four. Encode that in binary. and do it with three bits. Okay, so what would that be? And that's it, one zero zero. That's my exponent. Okay. And then the last one, so why this bias of three? Like I said, I'll explain that later. Okay, just for now, just do it. Uh, the last thing is the sign. Let me pick a different color. Well, is this number positive or negative? Positive, okay. And so we'll use the convention that a zero for the sign bit indicates positive and a one indicates negative. Okay. Our number's positive. Okay, great. So now we have all three of the constituent pieces. We just need to know how to put them together. Okay. And the way that we put them together is always sign first, exponent second, mantis a third. Okay. So it would be the sign bit was a zero, the exponent was one zero zero, and the mantissa was zero one zero zero. Okay, so that order of sign bit followed by exponent followed by mantissa, well, we would you guys agree that we need to have a consistent order that we all choose to agree on, right? Okay, now, back in the 60s and 70s, the scheme under which this was done was not standardized between different makers of different computers, okay? They were starting to kind of coalesce around a common thing. I mean, they basically were all doing sort of this scientific notation style thing, because that's just the logical choice. But the, uh, the order that you put these things in wasn't always the same, okay? Uh, and it depended on whose machine and software you were using. In 1984, a standard was ratified by the IEEE, which is the international something, 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 that's three letters E, I don't remember. It's basically one of... Um, um, a professional society and standards uh, organization for computing and electro, uh, electrical engineering and stuff like that. Okay, um, so the IEEE uh, ratified a standard called IEEE 754 that defined and standardized how floating point numbers would be encoded and stored. Okay, and uh, since then, there's been a couple of rat I mean amendments to it since then. Uh, but basically, uh, after about that point, you know, the mid 80s, everybody was on board with this particular standard. Okay, which is good because it means that the floating point, like I don't have to change the encoding because it came from an Apple. Um, you know, I encoded it on an Apple and then now I'm reading it on a on a, a Windows PC, right? It's it's standard. Uh, okay. So I triple E 754. Um, and you guys will be kind of uh, surprised by this, did not actually define an 8-bit standard. It defined a 16, a 32, and a 64-bit standard, okay? The reason 
is that nobody in their right mind would ever actually just use 8 bits for uh, encoding floating point numbers. It's not precise enough. 16 is sort of the minimum that's actually workable. Okay. Um, okay, so that sort of begs the question, well, then why, Dr. McKinney, are you going to have us do it with 8 bits if that's not a system that's actually used? Well, because it's easier to write down, right, and it's less tedious, right? The only differences between this and the uh, 16 and 32 and 64-bit schemes are, uh, one, how many bits we use for each field, okay? And two, you remember how I had this bias of three where I just said shut up and add three to the exponent and just don't argue? It's not three for the other standards, okay? It's a different number, uh, like it's 127 for the 32-bit standard, okay? Uh, those numbers are not picked out of thin air, but, um, uh, but for right now, just pretend that they're picked out of thin air. Okay, so IEEE never actually defined an 8-bit standard. So what I've showed you guys is basically if we imagined what the IEEE standard would look like for 8-bits, it would be this. Okay, everything matches in pattern what the, the, the true IEEE standard looks like. Okay, so is that okay? We, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, actually, I can also demonstrate one other thing here, which is, um, let me open a Safari tab. Um, okay, so I'm not looking for pool noodles or anything. I'm looking for this nice little website called Float Toy. Okay. So uh, this was a, um, a little tool that a, a guy programmed uh, to basically you can type in a number and it will encode it in either the 16, 32, or 64-bit standard. And one of these days when I get off my, off my lazy butt, I'm going to program in the 8-bit version just for completeness, sake of completeness. Okay, And uh, as a good, good example the numbers that he chooses as his examples when you just first load the website are pi, right? That's a pretty good and important number. And this demonstrates the maximum precision that one can encode the number pi in under the 16, 32-bit, and 64-bit standards, okay? And you guys can see, all right, in the 16-bit standard, 3.141, well, that's you know, NASA's not going to use it, but it's good enough for quick grade school computations. 32-bit, well, how many of you guys have that many digits of pi memorized at all? Okay. Uh, and then 64-bit, well, that's pretty dang good, right? Um, this does actually beg the question, how many bits does NASA use for pi when it's doing, like, interplanetary trajectory calculations? Like, if I wanted to send a space probe to Pluto... Right, <clears throat> I better be pretty precise about all those computations, yeah, because I want to actually get to Pluto and not miss and, you know, oh, I know I should have taken that left turn at Alpha Centauri. No, that was a kind of an attempt at a joke. I knew I should have made that left turn at Albuquerque, you know, Bugs Bunny. You guys know who Bugs Bunny was, okay. You, you know, uh, <clears throat> how he'd, he would be, you know, tunneling his way across the country, and he ended up in the middle of the desert, and, right, had to put up with Wiley e. Coyote, and, no, because he forgot to make the left-hand turn in Albuquerque when he was on his way to Pismo Beach with all the clams you could eat, no, <sighs> kids these days. Okay, so if, if, if I said kill the wabbit, would you guys have any idea what I was talking about? Okay, that I'm, my faith in humanity has been partially restored, but you guys know that. Okay, so anyway, um, how many bits this, or you know, what the, uh, precision does NASA use? Actually, the 64 bits good enough, okay? And, um, that that is enough to be precise to be like oh within an inch or so by the time you get out to the orbit of pluto 
And I think we could agree that being off by an inch, if you're that far away from the sun, is basically negligible, right? I mean, it's just an inch, okay? Um, so the 64-bit scheme is super precise. Uh, now, the other thing I not like about this, uh, the, the, the site that uh, Evan made, that's the guy who programmed it, uh, is you see how everything's color-coded, right? Well, the sign bit is blue, the exponent is green, and the mantissa is red. And like what we said before, it's really one point and then the mantissa stuff, right? But I don't have to write down that one because it's assumed. Okay, so what you notice is that the number of bits used for the exponent and the mantissa is different for each scheme, and it heavily favors the mantissa in terms of how many uh, bits you allocate to that, okay? Um, so, yeah. And you could, if you wanted, pick some other number and type it into either this box or that box, or you can even click the bits and see what would happen if you changed an individual bit, uh, which is kind of neat, okay? So, the best you can do with 16 bits for pi is 3.14. Let's figure out what the best you can do for 8 bits is. Any guesses? 3.1, okay, maybe just 3, okay, which is quite fitting as a number here in Indiana um, because what do you guys know about the pie bill from this about 100 years ago? Basically. Uh, now, there's it's a longer tail than that. They didn't like the bill didn't actually say pi shall be three, but it, it basically said that, okay. Um, and, and like I think I've mentioned before, right, I mean, that was here in Indiana. Like, that's the kind of crap I expect out of Arkansas or Alabama. It's not Indiana, um, but, yeah, say la vie. Uh, okay, so let's figure out what's the best we can do for pi under this 8-bit scheme. Oops. Okay, so pi 3.14159 dot dot dot. Okay. In order to do this, I need to write down 2 to the first, 2 to the zero, 2 to the minus 1, 2 to the minus 2, 2 to the minus 3, etc. Okay, so just get all of our places. Uh, and then I'm going to put sort of here in like super thick. That's where the radix is. Okay. So the three parts easy. It's just one, one. Okay. All right. So now we got to do some arithmetic. How many 0.5s fit into 0.14 blah, blah, blah? None of them. Okay, leaving us with a remainder of 0.14 blah 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 because we haven't taken anything out of it yet. How many 0.25s fit into 0.14 blah blah blah? None. Okay. Well, what's 2 to the minus third? 0.125. Does that fit into 0.141? Yes, one with some leftovers. Okay, now. Do I actually care what the leftovers are? I mean, I do, but I don't hear why, because I can't go that far, because how many bits have I written down? Five, and these four are the mantissa, and we said that thou shalt use a four-bit mantissa for uh, the eight-bit uh, system. Okay, so if I were working in higher bit precision, I would keep going. But I know that I can stop here because I've already filled out my four-bit mantissa. Okay? So this answers the question. We're not finished, obviously. But what's the best you can do with pi in the 8-bit system? 3.125. Which I think you guys would agree is not all that great. Yeah? Okay. So... So if we write our number in binary style scientific notation, it would be, oops, uh, 1.1001 times 2 to the uh, first, okay? 
because what did I do to the, well, okay, I'm sorry. Let me, let me back up a second. I've, I've jumped a step. 11.001 times two to the zero. That's really what I've written down, correct? Okay, but what's our rule about how much stuff goes before the radix? Exactly one bit, so I need to shift everything to this. 1.1001 times 2 to the first, and that's what I'm actually going to deal with. Okay, so we, Gucci? We? Oui? Uno. We. Oui. Okay, play bien. Okay, so um, what's my exponent? It's 1. I need to add the bias, and so now it's 4. In three bits, what is four using three bits? One, zero, zero. Okay. Our mantissa, we just said, was the stuff that followed the radix after we shifted it. And our sign is positive. Okay. So it means that we need to use a zero. And so our encoding would be sign bit exponent mantissa like so okay so that's the best we can do for pi and this is 3.125 uh, as a you know regular ordinary decimal which is you know about not that terribly far off from 3.14, but still I think we'd agree that's pretty freaking terrible, right? So the 8-bit system here, like I said, we would never actually use this in practice. Okay, it's absolutely terrible. Um, but the two benefits of us using it from a teaching perspective are one, it's less crap to write down. That's nice. Uh, and two, it really highlights the issue of precision or lack thereof. Okay, so the 16-bit system does have a limit of its precision. It's just that we have to go further to the right in order for us to see that. Uh, and the 64-bit version, right, there is a ultimate lack of precision at some point, but it's so small that, eh, I mean, look, if it's good enough to get a space probe to Pluto for NASA, it ought to be pretty good for pretty much anything else. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's the system. Now, I've got some notes for all of this that I need to post to Canvas, and I just realized I'd kind of forgotten to do that. Um, that uh, hopefully will, well, between that and this stuff, be handy to you guys, okay? Um, so, what we've done, these two examples, is I've taken a number, that I chose, and I figured out how to encode it in this crazy scheme. Well, what's, of course, the other thing that I might need to be able to do? Decode it, right? So if I handed you some random binary pattern, then to figure out what does that decode to, okay? And so it's sort of the reverse of the process we just did, but that's what we gotta do next, okay? Then on Monday, what we're going to throw into the mix is, well, if I can do, if I can encode and decode a single number, what about if I have multiple numbers and I want to start doing arithmetic with them? Then what? Right? Well, wait with bated breath until first thing Monday morning, and all shall be revealed. Huh? It is. Yes, you will all walk out of here, and I will be like SoCap, his eyes uncovered. No, nobody gets that one. It's from uh, Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Okay. Shaka when the walls fell. That's Star Trek reference. Okay. I mean, do you expect anything less out of me? No? Okay. All right, so... Be in my uniform. Yeah. All right, so let's pick a number. And I'm just kind of making something up here. Okay. 
All right. So, yes, Thomas, thank you for that. Oh, okay. Yeah. The sine bit is what? One, so negative. And the exponent bits are? One, zero, one. We'll figure out the encoding later. And the mantissa bits are one, one, zero, one. Okay, so step one is just carve it up into the three different chunks, the sine, the exponent, and the mantissa. The sine, of course, is the easy one, so, right, okay. Now, for the exponent, when I was encoding, what did I do to my exponent? I added that three, so I need to subtract that this time. Okay, so one, zero, one, what does that look like as a three-bit binary number? Looks like five, yes? Take three away from it. Okay, so even though the exponent looks like five, it really counts as two. Okay, and I freely admit does this, this bias thing kind of drive you crazy? Like, why the hell is it there? Yeah, it is weird. Just like I said earlier, shut up and do it. Okay. So you add the bias when you're encoding. You subtract it when you're decoding. Okay. Um, there is really a good reason to have that bias. And like I said, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, on Monday. And the mantissa is, well, we've got that. Okay. So if I were to write this in binary style scientific notation, the number I've got is this, okay? And notice the one that's in front of the radix, was that ever encoded in the number anywhere? No, and that's the whole point of this, right? Is I don't actually have to encode it, right? That's the brilliant thing, okay? I just, I know that it's gotta be that. Okay, because what else is it going to be? Can't be a zero, so it's got to be the one. Okay, so I've got that so far. Um, now, what does it mean to multiply by two to the second in terms of the radix? Move it two positions to the right. So this is equivalent to 111.01 times two to the zero. Okay, so... Um, let me tell you guys a, a, a little story, and Brad, you may have heard, Brad and Thomas, you guys may have heard this one before. I don't remember. Okay, so how many of you guys had uh, jobs when you were in high school? Uh, where'd you work? Nursing home. Auction house. That sounds fun. Can you talk? Can you do that? Huh? Okay. You can't do the, like, fast fast talking? Yeah. You worked at a pizza joint. Okay. So in college, um, amongst other things, I worked at Kohl's, okay, the department store. How many of you guys have shopped at Kohl's? Yeah. Or your mom's shop at Kohl's for you. I was employee number 1245936. Uh, I still remember that, which is kind of scary. Okay. Um, and will this be on your Kohl's charge today, sir? Oh, you don't have a calls charge. Well, if you open one today, we can save you 15% off your purchase. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. So what's the, the kind of rule about retail establishments? Do you ever actually pay full price for anything? No. It's always on sale. Everything's always on sale, right? So if you've got, you know, a t-shirt that says it's $19.99, you never actually pay $19.99 for it. There's always some percent off, right? And uh, companies are very good about manipulating your psychology to be like, okay, let's say they want to actually sell you the t-shirt for $20. What do they do? They make it $39.99, but it's a 50% off, right? Now, would you rather buy that T-shirt or the one that's nineteen ninety nine zero percent off? Same price, but what is psychologically, which one are you going to go for? The one that's on sale, 
right? Uh, okay, so the other thing that, that these establishments do um, is after a, a major holiday or something, anything that's from that holiday gets marked down just ridiculously because we want it the hell out the door uh, so that we can make room for the next holiday, right? So, you know, because it's what, September, so that means the truck with all the Christmas crap is going to be arriving like tomorrow because, you know, that's just the way the world works nowadays. All right, but the day after Christmas, right, there's going to be like 75% off all of the Christmas stuff. And then like a day later, it's now 90% off, right? So we really wanted to get out the door. So one day I was working, it was a couple days after Christmas, and I'm out on the sales floor and a lady comes up to me and she's got a couple things. And she says, um, is all the Christmas stuff 90% off? Like, yes, ma'am can you tell me how much this thing is? And she hands me something. Now, to be fair, that's a, a good question, right? Because that's the whole game at the retail establishments is it's not obvious how much the thing actually is. When you say 90% off, 90% off of what, right? Off of the, the original price, which is on the sticker or the barcode. That's the, the starting number. Okay, so I look at it. It's some like, you know, decorative item. $39.99, so I say $3.99, right? 90% off, okay? Off she goes. Comes back maybe 15 minutes later, cart full of stuff. Can you tell me how much all of this stuff is, right? And so I'm like, $2.99, $1.99, you know, boom, 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 going through it. And she's like, how are you do? you must be really good at math to be able to be like doing this that quickly. And I'm like, well, I am actually a math major, but that's not why I'm able to do it so quickly. Because 90% off means 10% of, and so I'm like, you see the decimal point? Just move it one spot to the left, and that's how much it costs, right? And she, her mind was blown, I'm thinking that how did you get out of high school, right? You're You're 20 years older than me at least, like, you know, surely they had standards in the 60s. We had the communists to beat. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so moving the radix one position or the decimal point, one position left or right is equivalent to dividing or multiplying by 10, okay, in base 10. Accordingly, Moving the radix one position left or right in the binary system is equivalent to doing what? Dividing or multiplying by two. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's the exact same idea, uh, except that fortunately Kohl's didn't use binary numbers for the prices because that would have really confused all the customers. Okay. Uh, okay. So, Here's where we've got it, 111.01 1, 1, 1. times 2 to the 0, and now we're almost finished. We just need to write these five things down along with their corresponding place values, okay? So what are my place values? I'll put my radix here. I've got 2 to the minus 1, 2 to the minus 2, 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1st, and 2 to the 2nd. And I've got this particular pattern. Okay, so let's deal with the stuff to the left of the radix. What is that? 4 plus 2 plus 1, 7. And what about the stuff to the right of the radix? Do I have any halves? No, but I do have a quarter. Okay, and so in decimal, I have 7.25. Uh, but what have I forgotten? The negative, hmm? no, we already dealt with the exponent, right? The exponent is what told us to do this, okay? And so there we go. Our number is negative seven and a quarter, okay? All right, so does that process make sense, right? The hardest part of this is remembering the bias, okay, which is that offset of a three. You add it one direction, you subtract it another. So with the eight bit process, it's always going to be three? Yes, the bias is always three, okay? Uh, and, and that's a good question, actually, right? So um, 
the bias for 32 bit is 127. It's always 127, right? It's not like I just made that up one day. There's a good reason why three or 127. Um, in our system here, it just so happens that it's the same as the number of bits as the exponent, but that's a coincidence. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So those biases were chosen for a very logical reason, and that I'll, I'll, we'll talk about why they need, uh, why it's actually a good thing on Monday. Right now, it drives you crazy, but there is a logical reason for it. Um, okay. So does this kind of make sense? It's a lot, a lot to do, yeah. Um, and uh, then, let's see what else. Just, I, I guess my, my um, um, suggestions here when you're encoding or decoding, right, is take it in stages like this. And if you're decoding it, the first thing is carve it up into the three different pieces, sine, exponent, mantissa and then start to put it together. And then for the decoding, or sorry, encoding, you're basically doing that in reverse, okay? Um, so what we'll talk about on Monday is, well, the, why the bias that will, will come into the discussion. But if I have multiple binary, or multiple floating point numbers and I want to do arithmetic with them, then what, okay? If I want to add or subtract two of these things, then, uh that's the question okay and the the thing i'll mention just right this instant is so when i write something as exactly one thing before the radix okay so the one that i never encoded and then whatever i need afterwards i'm going to call numbers written in such format uh, i'm going to call those normal or normalized okay and any number, like for example, 111.01 times two to the zero, does that violate the rule that we established? Technically, yes, because how many things are before the radix? More than one, okay? Uh, so a number that violates that rule, I will call the normal, okay? Uh, and what we'll have to do with the arithmetic is deliberately denormalize a number in order to do stuff, okay? Um, and we'll, yeah, like I said, we'll see that on Monday. Okay. All right. Uh, have a fantastic weekend and I will see you guys Monday, if not sooner.